All right, so we're right in the middle of histology, uh, and we've already talked about the fibrous connective tissues, and we also must have discussed the epithelial tissues, yeah. So epithelial and fibrous connective. Um, the next type of tissue you can see here, this is adipose tissue, and adipose tissue it's a pretty strange tissue when it comes down to it. It's really essential that we have it, but it's really bad when we have a lot of extra adipose tissue. Um, adipose tissue, it consists of a cell type called an adipocyte. And the adipocytes are going to be cells that <coughs> contain lipids. And also a nuclei. Primarily, we're going to find adipose tissue located in what's known as the subcutaneous or sub-Q compartment. So this is directly below the skin. And also, it's going to act in a covering or be incorporated into the covering over most of our organs. What is, what is my saying? Sub-Q. And that's just abbreviation for subcutaneous. Um, so what is the adipocyte and what is adipose tissue really important for? Well, one of the things is it stores lipids, which is an important energy molecule, but it also provides cushion. That's why we have a little covering in many of our organs or incorporated into many of our organs, provides extra cushion and protection. Uh, so obviously as this becomes more and more abundant, this is overweightness, obesity becomes more and more. Uh, problematic. Now, as far as a histology perspective, you looked at, at adipose tissue and what you saw was a lot of white under the white light that you were looking at. And that's because during the fixation process, which is basically the process of preparing the slide, all the lipids get <coughs> washed away. And you're just simply left over with the membrane, the shell of the adipocyte. And that's not because there wasn't anything there to begin with, but just because of the process it basically is a detergent or a, like a soap to help in the fixation process, and you lose that material. All right, our next uh, tissue here is cartilage, and there's a couple different types of cartilage, but cartilage, they all have uh, a common makeup, and that common makeup is going to be a matrix that contains a cell type known as a chondroblast. So matrix containing a chondroblast, and the matrix is going to have little cavities, so we're going to form cavities to put these chondroblasts in there. Those cavities are referred to as <coughs> lacunae. And once they get trapped inside of those cavities, they are going to differentiate and become a second type of cartilag cartilaginous cell, which is going to be a, well, not a cordocyte, a chondrocyte. Okay, so become chondrocytes once they get incorporated into that matrix and basically are going to get stuck in there, have to reside in that location. Now the way that we name this, this is a common feature, matrix and the chondroblast becoming chondrocytes. In addition, we begin to name the cartilaginous tissues based off of the type of fiber that's present. Okay, so the type of fiber that's present. And I'm going to introduce you to three different types. And we're actually going to come back and we'll talk more about each of these types as they're incorporated into various tissues that we are going to look at throughout the next semester and beyond. So the first type is hyaline cartilage. And this is a thin collagen that's going to be present. 
Uh, so here's a picture of highline cartilage. You can see the chondrocytes, and they're trapped up inside those little cavities called the lacunae within that matrix. And the thin strips of collagen that are present, you can't really begin to see them all that well. Up towards the periphery here, you can make out some of the fibers, but they're so thin that their uh, appearance is somewhat non-existent. But we can compare this <laughs> to the elastic collagen, which has a fiber, a proteinaceous fiber known as elastin. Again, you can begin to see the chondrocytes. You see maybe nuclei there and a small little uh, part of the cell. Um, and then the fibers are wrapped in here. You can see in a lot of places where the fibers are very, very dark and dense. And this is going to be elastic, making the, this uh, type of tissue much more elastic. And so in your mind, you should be thinking highline cartilage is very smooth and glassy. Maybe that protects the tips of my bones so I can have smooth glassy movement. Elastic cartilage is maybe going to show up in places where I need some more flexibility, for, uh, say maybe the the ear or the tip of the nose. Did that say elastin? Elastin, T-I-N, elastin, which is just a type of proteinaceous fiber. <laughs> and then last is going to be fibrocartilage. which are going to have bundles of collagen. And these bundles of collagen, you can actually see them wrapped up in this tissue in a variety of different places. Uh, so it's much thicker than the thin collagen fibers that we find with highline cartilage. This makes this type of tissue uh, much more resistant to uh, forces. And so you should be thinking more along the lines of the meniscus of the knee of uh, any of those padded-like structures where we are trying to protect against those types of forces being placed and imputed on the tissue. Now, many of the cartilages are actually going to have a covering, and it's called perichondrium. And this covering is going to basically allow for that transition to other types of, of tissue. So you can see here, this is a slide looking at the trachea, and we have highline cartilage here, our thin collagen cartilage. You can see the lacunae with the trapped chondrocytes. And then we have what looks sort of like fibrous tissue and then leading into uh, some uh, smooth muscle tissue here uh, of the trachea. And so that transition zone, this protective layer, separates the two different types of tissue that you can see here. All right, so let's move on to some of the more interesting tissues. And we're going to start with bone. And the reason that I say that this is more interesting is because most of us think of bone as basically being just about dead tissue. Right? It's just kind of there, and it helps support. It doesn't do a whole lot more. In all reality, bone is extremely dynamic and extremely important living tissue. And we'll come back and we'll hit on more of the um, structure of, of bone as we begin to talk about the skeletal system, which will be one of our first physiological systems. But before we move away from here, I want to just introduce you to a basic histological section that really begins to nicely highlight some of the really massive amounts of uh, physiology that's occurring inside of the bone. So uh, when we look at osseous tissue or bone tissue, there are two types. There's going to be spongy, and there's going to be compact. What you are looking at here is an example of, depending on level of detail, both spongy or compact bone. And what I mean, what I mean by that is the basic structure, which is this part of the tissue, 
is going to be present in both the spongy bone and the compact bone. Okay? And so this basic structure, which has many different <coughs> layers and this big opening in the middle, is a very important building block for bone tissue. That whole structure, and there's actually two of them present on this slide, here's one and here's the other, are known as the osteon. And the osteon is the basic building block uh, for bone, and we're going to find out some really interesting stuff, like two different osteons basically spiral in two different directions, kind of like screws into the bone, that increases the strength of the bone. Um, but yeah, so you have the osteon, and a lot of stuff going on here. In the middle, we have what's known as the haversian, or more commonly referred to as the central canal. And this provides uh, access to the rest of the bone to some major vessels, including arteries and veins, and also nervous innervation. So you have vessels that run up through, um, <clears throat> through the bone, through the central canals, and permeate into capillary beds and uh, nerve endings coming off of those nerves and vessels that are found in the central canal. You also can see a series of concentric circles surrounding the uh, surrounding the Herzlian or the central canal. And those layers are known as lamellae, which makes a lot of sense because you think about laminate countertops with the laminated tables that you're sitting at. It's a layer of material over a particle board. So we have these laminated layers <coughs> called lamellae, and within those layers you have these black dots. And those black dots are going to be the site of the osteocytes, which are the bone producing cells, and those osteocytes are contained in those cavities, and you probably already can guess the name of those cavities. I've already talked a little bit about them uh, when we were talking about cartilage. Lacunae. So the same name here is given to those small little cells inside of, or those small little cavities containing cells inside of the bone. And then the last part, which I think is pretty neat, is each of these small little lacunae, if we kind of blow one of these up, they have these little tiny channels that permeate up. And those are called, it, it sounds like, can I lick your eye? It's can you lick your eye? And these little tiny, these little tiny canals, which is literally what the, mean, the, the name means, allows two different cell compartments, two different lacunae and their associated cells, to interact, to mix the extracellular fluid that's being produced by this particular cell can travel up, and we now have an information system within the bone tissue so that we can exchange molecules that are being produced, hormones that are being produced, uh, and ma maintain <coughs> across the entire bone the processes that are occurring <coughs> within that structure. Okay, so those are the major anatomical features, and again, if it's compact bone, it's going to look very much like this, where we're going to have many of these osteons compacted together. Spongy bone, on the other hand, you're going to have individual osteons that make up a beam of, of bone. And then you'd have another one a little bit further away, and all of this in here would just be open space rather than compacted space. And so it looks more like a sponge, hence the name spongy bone, than real compact bone compacted together. <clears throat> All right, just a, kind of another look here at the, uh, at the bone. And, and don't confuse this here as being the Haversian canal. This is actually the whole bone. And you would find the compact tissue and the soft tissue compact on the outside spongy, not soft tissue, spongy bone on the inside, and, and it looks like this cut out here. So your Herversian canal is actually blood supply coming off of these main vessels that run up through the shaft of the bone or the diaphysis. Uh, you also have nervous supply in there as well. It interacts with each of these individual <coughs> osteon. So here's what our compact bone looks like and what I was trying to draw. Here you can now see in better detail that sponge-like structure and how an individual osteon forms kind of that beam that it, it uh, spans the gap between um, the, the different portions of that spongy bone. And then again, blowing everything up so you can see individual cells within their lacunae and then the uh, network of cannuliculi that allow interaction between those cells and all the other cells in that bone.
Now, the very outside of the bone, and you can see that peeled back here, is known as periosteum. So bone covered by periosteum. Now, I'm sort of bringing this up. We've talked about periosteum, and now we've also talked about perichondrium. And the term peri, P-E-R-I, is simply referring to outside, and then you'll notice that we have a reference to the tissue. So outside of the bone tissue, periosteum. Outside of the cartilaginous tissue, perichondrium. Outside of the heart tissue, maybe named peri, pericardium. Okay, so a lot of our individual organs, which by the way, this here is the tissue made up of spongy tissue and, and uh, compact tissue, and then you also have vascular and nervous tissue making up a whole organ known as a bone. Just to kind of give you a little peek ahead here towards what we're going towards. Uh, anytime you have an individual organ in human physiology, many times it's going to have some sort of cover. And a lot of times it's going to have the term peri put in front of the tissue type. All right, blood. Blood is a tissue. And the reason that it counts as a tissue is because all tissues have an extracellular matrix and various types of cells that provide similar function. It just so happens that the extracellular fluid, which I'm going to refer to as the ground substance, inside of blood is extra watery and that's going to be our plasma component. And so we have a high level of plasma, high level of fluid, higher than other types of tissues. But it still qualifies as a tissue, just like other tissues. Now, the ground substance plasma is only half of the equation. The other half is we need to have different types of cells. Now, there's one minor difference here in blood. We don't just simply refer to them as cells. We actually refer to them as formed elements. So formed elements. And formed elements are going to include two types of cells. Red blood cells, also known as erythrocytes. And white blood cells, which are also known as leukocytes. And there's really only one one type of red blood cell that we typically see in the blood. There's different stages or different levels of differentiation for cells that eventually become red blood cells, but in the blood itself, we typically just have that one type of red blood cell. Whereas with the leukocytes, the white blood cells, we actually have, this is a, a class name, not just a reference to a single type of cell. So we have various types of white blood cells. And what we're actually going to find out is those white blood cells actually really aren't blood cells at all. They're actually cells that show up in the blood and are transported throughout the blood system to be delivered to a variety of other types of tissues. And it ends up that these white blood cells are really more involved in immune defense. So they're more lymphatic tissue or cells rather than just red blood cells. Okay, so we've got two types of cells, but we're calling it formed elements because of this third element, which are known as platelets. And platelets are small fragments of cells that have basically been broken apart. And so these small little platelets, which you can see some of these fragments here in this picture, got our red blood cells here, and then our nucleated um, white blood cells, and then these tiny little specks all over the place, which are our platelets, they're basically pulled apart cells. And so they're not a full cell, but they still have a membrane. They have some organelle present as well. They just don't have the full array of all of the organelle <coughs> that usually are associated with a full cell. This one is, I guess blood, I don't know, I'm not sure why I had it as a, 
as a number eight. What did I have bone as? A seven. And in all reality, bone and blood are still just considered connective tissues. So those should be kind of lumped in that group of connective tissues. So we talked about the epithelium. We talked about connective tissues. We got two more to go, muscle and nervous. Muscle tissue is what we're going to hit on now. So this is a new category of tissue. And what you're looking at here in this figure is you have the microgram for the three types of, um, of muscle here on the right, and then just cartoon artist renditions of those three types of muscle tissue on the left. So the three types are going to be smooth, cardiac, and skeletal. Now, ironically, when we talk about the muscle system, which is a physiological system, we typically limit it to just skeletal muscle. Although it would be proper to call the muscle system smooth cardiac and skeletal muscle collectively. But the reason we do that is because an individual skeletal muscle, maybe it's biceps brachii that moves the forelimb of the arm, is an individual organ within the muscle system. Whereas cardiac is going to end up in the heart, which we're going to discuss when we're discussing circulatory system. And smooth muscle shows up in a variety of different places. There's actually examples of smooth muscle that are located in the vasculature within the circulatory system, reproductive system, digestive system, urinary system. And so we hit on the function of smooth muscle when we discuss those individual systems. So we put it in the context of the system where it's helping out with function. All right, so three types. Um, we're going to start out with skeletal muscle. And skeletal muscle is going to be long fibers. So the cells themselves that make up skeletal muscle are long fibers. They are multinucleated. And they are considered to be striated cells. And this term striation refers to what you can see here, these alternating, alternating light and dark bands running down the width of the muscle. Okay? So I say they're long fibers, <laughs> and this is really pretty cool, right? Because the cell, you know, we, we got a stereotypical cell that looks something like that. And we've already discussed that the stereotypical cell, we're never going to find it anywhere in the natural world. And this is a great example of a cell that doesn't look like this at all. These are long fibers, and you can just get a small little picture of those long fibers here in this picture. But inside of quadriceps femoris, one of our longest mu muscles in the human body, these individual long fibers, you'll have a single muscle fiber that'll run from the insertion point down to the origin just over the uh, patella. So that's a very, on me, I mean, it's, we're talking half a, half a meter. For people who are bigger, it's even bigger. So those are really long cells. They're also multinucleated, and part of this is because they are so long. There's an embryonic reason and then also a physiological reason. Embryonically, we had things called myocytes that came together during embryogenesis, each having their own nuclei, and they fuse together in these big, long chains and eventually become an individual muscle cell, and they leave the nucleus in place. The nucleus doesn't degrade, so you get nuclei down the length of that skeletal muscle cell. The other reason that this is really important, this muscle is so long, if I need proteins up here, I don't want to have to rely on a nucleus that's way down here. So I put nuclei holding all of that genetic information down the length of the cell in periodic locations. Yes? Is there a limit to how many nucleuses, nuclei are in the muscle cell? That is a good question. I don't have an answer for that. I don't. Um, it, it's going to depend on the length because the length comes from the number of individual cells that get stuck together. And the more cells, the longer the, the, the and, and resulting cells are going to be. Um, 
The biggest limiting factor here on space comes from the striations, these alternating light and dark bands. Once we get to the muscle system a little later this semester, we're going to talk about the molecular reasons for those striations. And being from the molecular world myself, I love that kind of stuff. So we're going to go into a lot of detail. Um, but let's just suffice it to say that those striations are the contractile proteins that help that muscle shorten. And we'll talk about the molecular physiology there uh, in, in a, a couple of weeks. They're so packed or densely packed in there, those proteins, that the, the nuclei, they're not just drawing them out here on the exterior just because that was the convenient place to draw the nuclei. They get, the nuclei get pushed out towards the exterior of the cell. All the other organelles kind of have to fit into those striations. The striations are very important in the concept of shortening that muscle cell so everything else works around the proteins that make up or account for those striations. All right, what about cardiac muscle? Cardiac muscle, these are actually going to be much smaller cells. They are typically referred to as myocytes or really a great name for them is a cardiomyocyte, meaning a heart muscle cell. They're going to just have a single nucleus, just one nucleus. They're going to contain, or the nuclei are going to be surrounded by glycogen, which is a storage molecule for glucose. So one nucleus, a lot of glycogen. The cells are going to have a branched appearance, which you can see that here. So here would be an individual cell. Right here, here's the nucleus. And you can see that I have many branches coming off of that individual cell. So these branches come off of the cell. And then they have a really interesting interaction with neighboring cells. I'm going to call that um, their contact with other cells comes through this specialized gap junction that's known as an intercalated disc. So an intercalated disc. Um, and that's what you see represented here by this squiggly line. And I called it a gap junction. Hopefully you can remember what a gap junction is, but just briefly, a gap junction is basically proteinaceous pores where the cytosol between two different cells can move across through those pores. So anything that happens in one cell is going to easily be transmitted to the other cell. And this is vitally important for the cardio, uh, car for the uh, for the heart because when one of these muscles contracts, I want to send that signal immediately to another cell so that that muscle will contract or that cell will contract to cause the heart to undergo its full contraction for pumping blood. And so that's facilitated at these gap junctions where whatever is happening inside of this cell is permeated into this cell and this cell here can respond to that change. One of the biggest things that happens is exchange of ions. We're going to move things like sodium and potassium around these cells to generate electrical signals that help to stimulate and cause these muscles to contract. And in fact, what's really cool about this, but we won't get to until A and P number two, is that that signal to contract is autorhythmic or self-propagating. It starts in the heart. We don't need a nerve. We don't need any endocrine innervation. We don't need anything else. If you take the heart cells out and put them into a petri dish and they've done this, they'll start out and they're all contracting at different rates and eventually they get to a point where they're contracting all together in a syncytium which is really, really neat. Um, and it helps to keep, the, by having these gap junctions present in a specialized form of the cardiomyocyte called a conduction cell, we can generate a very rhythmic contraction of these cells where the anatomy defines how the heart actually pumps blood and works physiologically. So the intercalated disc is the, the linked part of... 
in your drawing. Yeah, so it's going to be this this part be that. Right, right there. And and if we were to go into a lot of detail, which there's mm -hmm. actually great pictures in your book, mm -hmm. there's a lot of proteins in there. You'll see that there are holes that are formed, pores that are worn, formed to allow that movement of the cytosol between the two different cells. And whatever happens here is going to shortly be picked up by that other cell, and that other cell is going to respond in a very similar fashion. All right. The third type of muscle is smooth muscle. And smooth muscle is actually a little bit different. Um, you'll notice that skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, they both are striated. I don't know if I mentioned that. Did I mention striations up here with cardiac muscle? Cardiac muscle is also striated. And it's very similar protein structure to the skeletal muscle. So the contraction happens in a very similar way. Smooth muscle, muscle, on the other hand, is non-striated. And it turns out you would think, oh, OK, so they don't have the same contractile proteins. And that's not entirely true. What in reality is going on here is the proteins are organized in a slightly different way. So if we look at an individual cardiomyocyte, which has more of a fusiform type structure, again, a single nucleus, no striations, rather than having that very distinct banding pattern, the filaments are actually organized in sort of oblong, obtuse type angles to each other. So when a skeletal muscle or cardiac cardiomyocyte contracts, it contracts basically in one direction. When a smooth muscle cell contracts, it contracts in a variety of different directions because of the orientation of those proteins, the contractile proteins. And this is very important for smooth muscle. Again, it has that fusiform structure, a fusiform myocyte. And it's very important because these are typically regulating the size of a tube. And if we just have a tube and the cell can only move in one direction, the tube is just going to close down in one direction. But we really want to regulate diameter. And so we want to squeeze it kind of like we're pulling on a drawstring for a stuff sack. And the, the uh, cardiomyocytes, I'm sorry, the, uh, um, the myocytes for smooth muscle can facilitate that reduction in diameter rather than just kind of a one directional squeezing. All right, last tissue of the night is going to be nervous tissue. Now, the way that this was prepped, uh, this is actually called a smear. And basically, the way that uh, this type of slide is produced is we take a piece of nervous tissue and we just smear it across the slide and kind of spread everything out. And when we do that with nervous tissue, two cell types become present. And those two cell types are going to be neurons and neuroglia. Neurons and neuroglia. When thinking about nervous system physiology, think of neurons as the workhorse. Their main function is to generate, propagate, and potentiate signals. When we think of neuroglia, think of the protectors. These are going to be cells that help to maintain the neurological tissue so that the neuron can most effectively potentiate and move a signal from point A to point B. Neurons are another example. And you can see the neurons here. These are the cells that have the big cell bodies. All these little dots in here, those are called neuroglia. Those are the support cells. The neurons are another classic example of a cell that doesn't fit the stereotype. The cell body is where the nucleus is held. But extending from the cell body, you have a variety of contact points that are known as dendrites. 
and you have one major contact point that moves down, and it can be meters long. If I'm trying to move a neuron from my spinal cord down to the muscles, maybe it's a adductor holicus, which is one of the uh, muscles that helps me move my big toe. That that, in that cell in me is going to be almost a meter and a half in length. You have the cell body, which is very, very small, and then about a meter and a half of axon leading towards that interaction with the muscle, which is known as the neuromuscular junction. Or it's a junction, a synapse between the nervous system and another type of tissue. And so the signal that's generated in the spinal cord travels very quickly down the neuron down that axon to cause the muscle to respond in some way, contract or relax, whatever the case may be. I guess I'm out of room here. All right. Um, I want to talk about two more, two more things. Let's talk about two more things. Just a brief review of cell contact, cell cell contact. You should have gotten this in a previous biology class. These are known as cell junctions. And these are lo the locations of cells where they interact with other types of cells. And there are three categories of, um, of cell junctions or cell-cell contacts. The first are tight junctions, and you can see the tight junction here at the top. And what happens with the tight junction is it's so tight that the membranes of two different cells adhere together close enough that nothing can permeate between them. So there's no extracellular fluid that moves in between those two cells. They are tightly adhered together. So whatever happens in this cell uh, mechanically is going to be distributed into the other cell mechanically because of that close contact, that tight contact. We've already mentioned gap junctions in reference to the intercalated disc. And you can see the gap junction here on the bottom. Again, you have those pore-like structures between two different cells. So we have the membranes of two different cells with these pore-like structures allows mixing of the cytosol from those two different cells. And also it allows some cell adherence. Those two cell membranes are going to be physically attached together through those proteins. And then the last of the gap junctions are the desmosomes. And you can see the desmosomes here. And really, the desmosomes are just simply anchorage. They anchor the membranes together. There are proteins that span inside of both cells and then across the membranes to hold those cells together. Now, we'll come back and we'll hit on glands uh, in a variety of uh, tissues and uh, organ systems that we are going to be talking about uh, as we progress through this semester and next semester. Uh, but just to kind of give you a little bit of an introduction, um, I want you to begin to think about two different types of glands. Exocrine glands which are going to be found, they basically are incorporated in tissues, incorporated in organs, to excrete substances. And as they secrete those substances, those substances make their way into a duct system, and the secretion is delivered 
either to the like, surface, maybe it's the surface of the skin or into the digestive tract or uh, some other lumen of an organ through a duct, a well-defined structure. And you can see here's a variety of different types of exocrine glands. And you can think of probably a variety of different types of tissues where we might see exocrine type ducts. Integumentary system with our sweat glands. Uh, the uh, female reproductive system with the mammary tissue producing uh, milk. Uh, we may also see this in the pancreas as it delivers uh, pancreatic solutions into the digestive system through the common bile duct to allow and facilitate things like protein di digestion. The second type of gland that we sometimes see in tissue section are endocrine glands. And the delivery of the substance produced by an endocrine gland is slightly different. Rather than having the duct system, an endocrine gland is highly vascular, meaning that there is a nice blood supply and that excreted material, typically referred to as a hormone, is delivered into the bloodstream. So it's delivered into the bloodstream and then it circulates absolutely everywhere. The exocrine gland typically is excreted into the lumen of an organ or onto a surface and it doesn't distribute everywhere. We don't generate sweat and then pick that up and circulate sweat everywhere. It's laid out on the surface of our skin. <coughs> 